Okay, today we're going to be looking at minerals and their properties. And most of you have seen minerals and uh, noted that some minerals are very pretty. Uh, but we're going to be talking about uh, the uses of minerals. And uh, at the end, you have a set of unknowns in front of you that you'll be identifying. So minerals are important because all of our metals that we need come from minerals. Uh, this mineral provides most of the iron for the world. Other minerals provide lead, aluminum. Uh, minerals also provide materials like clay to, to make bricks and ceramics or some minerals like this one we use to make glass. Uh, so minerals have our predominant uses in everyday life. And another thing about minerals is they're the building blocks of rocks. So we actually identify different kinds of rocks based on the minerals they're made out of. This one is comprised of pink feldspars and quartz. And when you get that combination together, we call that granite. Uh, other rocks are made of different minerals and have other names. So this one, has, this gabbro, has no quartz or feldspar like the granite. If you read your reading assignment, you know that uh, minerals have a kind of complex definition. They're naturally occurring inorganic solids having a constant chemical composition and constant atomic structure. And that's a pretty uh, difficult definition to grab a handle of if we don't break it down into individual parts. So the first one has to be naturally occurring. So if you have ice on a pond, uh, that's a mineral. But if you make ice for your margaritas, uh, then that's not a mineral. has to be inorganic, so generally it's not made through biological processes, and most minerals don't have carbon in them. Uh, it also has to be a solid, so when that ice on the pond melts, it stops being a mineral and just becomes liquid water. Uh, the fourth part is it has to have a constant chemical composition, so anytime you pick up this mineral, uh, table salt, it's always made of one atom of sodium to one atom of chlorine and it has to have a constant chemical, constant atomic structure. Uh, so that means the atoms are being all the same for each mineral, always fit together the same way, and that results in very distinctive crystal shapes for different minerals. Uh, this one is a rhombohedral, it always comes in rhombohedrons. Uh, this one always comes in cubes. And this one, that you're very familiar with, quartz, has a hexagonal or six-sided crystal structure to it. Okay, because of the constant atomic structure and, and constant chemical composition, minerals also have constant properties that we can use to identify them. And one of them is based on how they break. And some minerals, like this quartz, will break in an unpredictable manner called fracture because all of the atomic bonds in the silicon dioxide are equally strong. Whereas other minerals have weak planes in their bonding and like this mica, it's very predictable that it always will split in these thin sheets along those weak planes. And that property is called cleavage. So Dolly Parton and some minerals uh, both have cleavage in common. Uh, but with the minerals, you actually have to break them to see theirs. Other minerals uh, can be identified uh, by color, and uh, some of them are constant in their color, but many of them are variable. So instead of taking the natural color, one way we identify them is through streak. And streak is taking a mineral and rubbing it on a piece of porcelain, and then this mineral called specular hematite changes from a very silvery color to a reddish brown dried blood color. Uh, and we can identify it that way. Just as uh, pyrite or fool's gold looks like gold naturally, but if we powder it, it gives us a black streak. Uh, so we can tell fool's gold from regular gold, which would give us a gold streak. So, uh, 
So some college students and some minerals streak, but when the college students streak, they leave their clothes behind and minerals just leave a powder behind. Using a, the different suite of mineral properties, we can take an unknown mineral and figure out just what it is. Um, uh, one way we can test it is through something called hardness. And hardness sounds like how hard you have to hit a mineral before it breaks. But actually that's not the definition of hardness. Hardness is how easy a mineral is to scratch. And some minerals are so soft, they actually are scratched by paper. And you're familiar with this mineral, graphite, because we put it inside little wooden sticks and scratch graphite on paper. And we call those sticks pencils when they do that. But graphite actually has, it's so soft, it's graded on a scale of one to 10. Graphite is only a one. Uh, other minerals, like this gypsum, is soft enough to scratch with your fingernail. So gypsum has a hardness of two, because your fingernail has a hardness of two and a half. It's harder than the gypsum. Other minerals are so hard, like this quartz, they can actually scratch glass. And this one's leaving a very distinctive scratch behind in the glass. So you may have seen old uh, uh, movies in the past where somebody tried to sell somebody else a diamond in a bar and whipped out their, their diamond ring and scratched it on the glass, but that easily have had quartz rather than diamond. So half of all the minerals will scratch glass. They all have a hardness of six to 10, and those all scratch glass. Another property is some minerals actually show a magnetic personality, and so if you take a magnet to them, the magnet isn't attracted to any of these, but to this mineral, it actually will stick to it. And so we can identify that mineral as magnetite because of that magnetic property. And some minerals are distinctive that they actually have taste. And this mineral here, if you touch it to your tongue, it tastes like salt. So we can identify halite or table salt, and uh, it's actually commercially valuable if you crunch it up into little uh, crystals and through its cleavage, put it in some nice packaging, then you can sell that as table salt, put it on your food. Uh, other minerals are chemically reactive. So if you have a magic fluid, this is actually dilute hydrochloric acid, and if I drop it on this mineral, the mineral bubbles. So this is a mineral called calcite, and it's made out of calcium carbonate, and through the re chemical reaction with the hydrochloric acid, it's giving up its carbon dioxide, and that makes it very distinctive and easy to identify. Okay, I mentioned earlier, one of the most important things about minerals is that we can get valuable things we need from the earth through mineral deposits, and uh, many of our important minerals are called ores. If you can make a profit from the mineral uh, by processing it and get what you need, then it's called an ore. And this is the ore of lead. This chemical formula is easy to remember because it's PPS, or lead sulfide. And just like the uh, uh, national TV channel, PBS, you can remember that one. Uh, the tricky part is getting the lead out of the ore. Okay, so we could take this lead ore, galena, and which is lead sulfide, and put it in a furnace to smelt it. So the PBS and oxygen with heat goes off as sulfur oxides and leaves the lead behind. The problem is sulfur oxides are major pollutants because in the atmosphere, in the clouds, they react with water and the Sulfur oxides are socks, and that makes sulfuric acid rain, or H2SO4. So what uh, we need to do now when we process these sulfur ores is use a wet gas scrubber, which in the stacks causes this reaction to occur, and then we can capture the H2SO4. So basically the result is it knocks the socks off, the gases. 
Okay, so now that you know about minerals and their properties, uh, get out your box of unknowns, and we're going to use the properties of these unknowns to identify what minerals you have.